Many Midwestern states celebrate their agricultural abundance each year at the state fair. For some of these states, a key feature of the fair for over a century has been butter sculpture. Norma Duffield Lyon, affectionately known as Duffy, sculpted butter into the form of cows, other farm animals, cartoon characters, famous people, and even scenes such as the Last Supper. Her sculptures were displayed at the Iowa State Fair for 46 years, from 1960 to 2006. She also sculpted butter for the fairs of other states, including neighboring Illinois, for 32 years. Duffy was both a farmer and an artist. She earned a degree in animal science from Iowa State University, where she had also studied sculpture. In college, I took a couple of uh, courses and, and from the late Christian Peterson, and, and I, that was more than just a class. I mean, uh, I knew his family and, and Charlotte, and, and it worked out to mean a lot to me. I never dreamed that I'd be in that field, but here I am. <laughs> In 2003, after meeting Duffy the first time, I wrote these notes about her process. She starts with choosing a dairy cattle breed, Holstein, Guernsey, Jersey, Brownswith, Ayrshire, or Milking Shorthorn, then works from sketches or photographs. She places five to 600 pounds of butter, about 2,400 sticks, on a wooden and chicken wire armature. At first, Duffy adds large handfuls to the frame to approximate the shape of the cow and eventually fine tunes the form with smaller additions of butter, working both with her hands and sculpting tools in a display case refrigerated to 38 degrees. The process takes about a week. Duffy would usually schedule her work to be finished in the first days of the fair so that attendees could see her in process. Many fair goers consider the butter cow to be the definitive fair experience. Information booth volunteers told us that the most common questions they're asked are where are the bathrooms and where's the butter cow? In the dairy building, of course. Some lifelong devotees of the butter cow travel from the West Coast or will pay hundreds of dollars to assist with sculpting the tail through the fair's Blue Ribbon Foundation. Duffy passed away in 2011. Her obituary appeared in the New York Times, announcing the death of the butter cow lady. It was less than two months before the Iowa State Fair was to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the butter cow. The first butter cow in the United States appeared in 1911 at the Iowa State Fair. The sculpture was sponsored by the Beatrice Creamery, who wished to display the success of the local dairy industry and promote local products. The advertisement worked with a 6% increase in sales the next year, and soon other states followed suit, with Illinois, Minnesota, and Ohio joining the butter art tradition soon thereafter. Indiana and Wisconsin similarly developed traditions of cheese sculpture. These art forms made from dairy products came to occupy an iconic position for locals. In essence, the butter cow came to symbolize what enthusiasts see as Midwestern values. And like all icons, the butter cow adapts to symbolize prevailing social issues and political perspectives. Anthropologist Milton Singer writes that such cultural displays cast light on the way in which cultural themes and values are communicated, as well as on processes of social and cultural change. The context in which butter sculpture now exists gives immediacy to the art form as the social dramatic action of transformed farmland takes shape in and legitimizes butter sculpture as culturally and artistically important. What was once a symbol of progress now has come to be a nostalgic representation of a disappearing way of life. As family farms disappear and concentrated animal feeding operations replace them, the butter cow stands as a testament to the idealization of the past and the values associated with it. While these artistic displays represent the rich heritage of the Midwestern tradition of farming, there's a dramatic shift occurring in American agriculture. In the Midwest and Great Plains of the United States, it's barely possible to drive any stretch of land without noticing that fields once filled with grazing cattle have turned to giant corrugated metal structures built to house those same cattle and thousands more 
in a production-oriented concentrated animal feeding operation, or CAFO. As this type of operation invades the landscape, family farms quickly dwindle to make room. Most state laws define a family farm as one in which at least half of voting stockholders are the members of a related family. At least one stockholder must manage the farm and two thirds of the corporation's earnings must come from farming. These businesses began steadily disappearing from site beginning in the mid 1990s. Farming has been crucial to the American economy since the first days of settlement. With vast stretches of fertile land, agriculture became the first rewarding utilization of colonial America. Throughout most of the nation's history, small family farms provided staple food products to the whole country. As time elapsed, however, technology was introduced into farming and it became increasingly advantageous for agriculture to turn into a large scale operation. As American industry globalized, farmers found themselves pressed to produce more, quicker, making farms run in factory style far more profitable than the traditional small model. The farming style was intensified when the agricultural boom of the 1970s was followed by a bust in the early 1980s. Many small farm owners were put out of business as a result of risks taken while the business thrived. Barry Barnett writes, low output prices and drought conditions in 1980 and 1983 took a heavy toll on farm income. The combination of low net farm income and high interest rates sent asset values plummeting. Nationally, the value of farm assets declined about 30% between 1981 and 1987. Barnett continues that by the late 1970s, land prices were so high that in many cases, producers could no longer pay for agricultural land with the returns from agricultural production on that land. It's no surprise that so many farming operations failed allowing large corporate entities to take over. One man who lost his farm as a result of these factors expresses his loss. We have the technology to farm really large farms and now they're concentrating. Well, they've been doing it with poultry for years now. We're seeing it in hogs and cattle and all these other areas. There's really no way you can stop it. As individual farmers become unnecessary for supporting a growing industry in a now global economy, they're left behind. This expendability is of course undesirable for family farmers, but their spirits have not been quelled. Anthropologist Catherine Dudley paraphrases farm owners she's interviewed when she says farming is no business for people who cannot think for themselves, take responsibility for their actions, and most importantly, pay themselves last. There's an implication that factory farms with their profit making mentality will not have the last word. The rich traditions of farming communities continue boldly, even as family operations are being lost. In Iowa, Duffy made sure to train a new generation of butter sculptor to ensure continuity of the tradition. Sarah Pratt reflected on this shortly after Duffy's death. It's very disappointing and sad to, to come into this fair season with that shadow and with that thought of we, what could have been the experience we could have shared and i just had all of these doubts and she just kept telling me year after year you can, you can do this and so having her believe in me to such an extent even the year she did retire in 2006 and she called me and said this is what you're going to sculpt you're going to do it you're fine i've already told them you're going to do it you have to do it um the doubts I still had at that point um, and the support she gave me the next five years were just life-changing. In other places, this transition has not been smooth. Traditions take on new meaning in the shifting context and at times are subject to contestation. In Illinois, the loss of intimate farming knowledge intersected with butter art when new sculptors were deemed less capable because of their lack of knowledge of bovine anatomy. The Illinois State Fair first featured a butter cow in 1921. They continued this tradition with various artists over the years and beginning in 1969 hired Duffy to sculpt their cow as well. In 2001, however, Duffy noticed her health was declining and traveling to Illinois to work was hard on her. Though she continued to sculpt the cow in Iowa, she announced it would be her last year creating the Illinois butter cow. 
In 2002 and 2003, the Illinois Butter Cow was created by a husband and wife food sculpting team, Nancy and Reggie Heiss of Wisconsin. Nancy Heiss has received considerable fame as a result of her cheese carving for large companies and her book, The ABCs of Cheese Carving. She was hired because of her experience sculpting life-size animals. While certainly a qualified artist, Nancy Heise lacks a background in agriculture that can give sculptures such as Duffy's a true sense of authenticity. Despite her Midwestern roots, many fair visitors felt her talent did not compare to Duffy's. I overheard numerous dairy farmers and others experienced in bovine anatomy talk of the sculpture's shortcomings. Duffy always sculpted specific breeds and even the veins on her sculpted udders were anatomically correct. However, when the new sculptor's cow was unveiled, a longtime Dairy Association employee scoffed, this one just looks like a mule with tits. For the 2004 fair, Nancy and Reggie were replaced by Sharon Booman of from Syracuse, New York. Though her regular work is more traditional sculptures, she has been creating butter cows in Texas and Oklahoma for eight years. Booman takes an entirely different approach, including a detailed barnyard scene. Duffy always created a very realistic, detailed cow, while Buman created a memorable picture. As Dick Moore, longtime dairy building manager at the Illinois State Fair, commented, comparing the two is like apples and oranges. Though the variety of approaches and reactions are perhaps merely the result of artistic differences, they're more likely indicative of something more significant. Archaeologist Michelle Hedgeman writes, Though variation is not necessarily imbued with social information, it may, under certain circumstances, take on iconographic cultural meanings. An unconscious tradition may become significant in times of conflict. The accurate rendering of a buttery bovine form is not just skill, but the expression of a way of life. As those with Duffy's ability grow older, their knowledge becomes less accessible. Soon, this lexicon may be lost forever. Authenticity, whether cultural or aesthetic, is a notion that serves political interests. The butter cow, as displayed at the state fair, evokes place-based pride and nostalgia in its viewers, reconnecting them to the state and the agricultural lifestyle being promoted within the fair. Just as small farming operations and the cultural knowledge that accompanies them seem to be quickly disappearing, butter sculptures cannot last forever. Even today, butter sculpture is impermanent because of the impossibility of storing butter in its sculpted form for long periods of time. The artists invest immense emotion and time into their creations, which will be destroyed in mere weeks. This temporality parallels the impending demise of small farms. The butter cow as an institution is placed within the conflict of the industrialization of agriculture and it is from this clash that much of its current meaning is derived. The sculptures could be viewed not only as pride in small family farming, but also as a push to preserve this way of life and associated values. This art gives urgency to conditions of farmland. New meaning has been endowed upon these customs as ways of life change, and as knowledge of small family farms disappears in the wake of the rise of factory farms. These artworks take on new implications, and their relevance becomes increasingly valuable as symbols for examining the past and considering the future.